How he could have missed such an earth-shaking sound, I don't know. This may seem odd, but it might have been a sound that only I could hear. Some special kind of sound. Not even Kay's dog seemed to notice it. And you know how sensitive dogs are to sound. I told myself to run over to Kay, grab hold of him, and get out of there. It was the only thing to do. I knew that the wave was coming, and Kay didn't know. As clearly as I knew what I ought to be doing, I found myself running the other way, running full speed towards the dike alone. What made me do this, I'm sure, was fear, a fear so overpowering it took my voice away and set my legs to running on their own. I ran, stumbling along the soft sand beach to the breakwater, where I turned and shouted to Kay. Hurry, Kay, get out of there, the wave is coming. This time, my voice worked fine. The rumbling had stopped, I realized. And now, finally, Kay heard my shouting and looked up. But it was too late. Uh -oh. A wave, like a huge snake with its head held high, poised to strike, was racing towards the shore. I had never seen anything like it in my life. It had to be as tall as a three-story building. Soundlessly, in my memory at least, the image is soundless, it rose up behind Kay to block out the sky. Kay looked at me for a few seconds, uncomprehending. Then, as if sensing something, he turned towards the wave. He tried to run, but now there was no time to run. In the next instant, the wave had swallowed him. Now, one of the things that makes this story so compelling is the way in which events are described. Notice again, more personification, the wave, Again, the simile, like a huge snake, paragraph 31. I hope that you, I hope that you made a, a note of this. With its head held high, poised to strike, was racing towards the shore. Two observations here. Notice that our storyteller, the seventh man, knows something terrible is about to happen. Instead of running down and grabbing Kay, he runs up and will yell at Kay, and by that point, it's too late. Number two, notice how quickly the part of our story gets told where Kay is going to have the wave hit him. And of course, this wave is way too big for anyone to be able to survive this kind of a situation. Let's now turn, paragraph 32, we're about officially halfway through our story, obviously, in terms of paragraph count. And now, we're going to have to deal with the aftermath. Let's, let's concentrate, focus. Some of you will point out this is one of the sadder stories that we'll ever study together. Crashed onto the beach, shattering into a million leaping waves that flew through the air and plunged over the dike where I stood. I was able to dodge its impact by ducking behind the breakwater. The spray wet my clothes, nothing more. I scrambled back up onto the wall and scanned the shore. But then the wave had turned and with a wild cry was rushing back out to sea. It looked like part of a gigantic rug that had been yanked by someone at the other end of the earth. Nowhere on the shore could I find any trace of Kay or of his dog. There was only the empty beach. The receding wave had now pulled so much water out from the shore that it seemed to expose the entire ocean bottom. I stood alone on the breakwater, frozen in place. The silence came over everything again, a desperate silence, as though sound itself had been ripped from the earth. The wave had swallowed Kay and disappeared into the far distance. I stood there. Wondering what to do. Right, what to do. Should I go down to the beach? Kay might be down there somewhere, buried in the sand. But I decided not to leave the dike. I knew from experience that big waves often come in twos and threes. I'm not sure how much time went by. Maybe 10 or 20 seconds of eerie emptiness. Then, just as I had guessed, the next wave came. Another gigantic roar shook the beach, and again, after the sound had faded, another huge wave raised its head to strike. It towered before me, blocking out the sky like a deadly cliff. This time, though, I didn't run. I stood rooted to the sea wall, entranced, waiting for it to attack. What good would it do to run, I thought, now that Kay had been taken? 
or perhaps I simply froze, overcome with fear. I can't be sure what it was that kept me standing there. The second wave was just as big as the first, maybe even bigger. From far above my head, it began to fall, losing its shape like a brick wall, slowly crumbling. It was so huge that it no longer looked like a real wave. It was like something from another far-off world that just happened to assume the shape of a wave. I readied myself for the moment the darkness would take me. I didn't even close my eyes. I remember hearing my heart pound with incredible clarity. The moment the wave came before me, however, it stopped. All at once it seemed to run out of energy, to lose its forward motion and simply hover there in space crumbling in stillness. And in its crest, inside its cruel, transparent tongue, what I saw was pain. Two quick observations. Notice, waves come in sets. And so as a young boy, he's been taught enough to know to not run down there because of the possibility of the second wave. But notice that he is ready, right? He's ready to... Uh, to go ahead and, and let the second wave take him. He's frozen in fear. Now that he's lost his best friend Kay, he stands there. But notice, inexplicably, it's as if the wave freezes. He doesn't, he says, I didn't even close my eyes. And because he doesn't close his eyes, he's able to see into the wave. And there, in the wave, he will see his pal. He will see K. Now, of course, this story is going to set up issues of not just survival, but what we will call for your notes, write it down, survivor's guilt. That notion of why was my friend taken and not me? Now we're paying attention to the ways in which K will uh, be, be gone, taken out by, and our speaker will have to come to terms with what it means. This is his last sight of his pal. We're in paragraph 37. Let's go ahead now, focus, continue to pay attention. Some of you may find this impossible to believe, and if so, I don't blame you. I myself have trouble accepting it even now. I can't explain what I saw any better than you can, but I know it was no illusion, no hallucination. I am telling you as honestly as I can what happened at that moment, what really happened. In the tip of the way, as if enclosed in some kind of transparent capsule, floated Kay's body, reclining on its side. But that is not all. Kay was looking straight at me, smiling. There, right in front of me, so close that I could have reached out and touched him, was my friend. My friend, Kay, who only moments before had been swallowed by the wave. And he was smiling at me. Not with an ordinary smile. It was a big, wide-open grin that literally stretched from ear to ear. His cold, frozen eyes were locked on mine. He was no longer the K I knew. And his right arm was stretched out in my direction, as if he were trying to grab my hand and pull me into that other world where he was now. A little closer, and his hand would have caught mine. But, having missed... Kay then smiled at me one more time, his grin wider than ever. I seemed to have lost consciousness at that point. The next thing I knew, I was in bed in my father's clinic. As soon as I awoke, the nurse went to call my father, who came running. He took my pulse, studied my pupils, and put his hand on my forehead. I tried to move my arm, but I couldn't lift it. I was burning with fever. My mind was clouded. I had been wrestling with a high fever for some time, apparently. You've been asleep for three days, my father said to me. The neighbor who had seen the whole thing had picked me up and carried me home. They had not been able to find Kay. I wanted to say something to my father. I had to say something to him. But my numb and swollen tongue could not form words. I felt as if some kind of creature had taken up residence in my mouth. My father asked me to tell him my name, but before I could remember what it was, I lost consciousness again, sinking into darkness. 
Altogether, I stayed in bed for a week on a liquid diet. I vomited several times and had bouts of delirium. My father told me afterwards that I was so bad that he had been afraid I might suffer permanent neurological damage from the shock and high fever. One way or another, though, I managed to recover. Physically, at least. But my life would never be the same again. They never found <coughs> Kay's body. They never found his dog, either. Usually, when someone drowned in that area, the body would wash up a few days later on the shore of a small inlet to the east. Kay's body never did. The big waves probably carried it far out to sea, too far for it to reach the shore. It must have sunk to the ocean bottom to be eaten by the fish. The search went on for a very long time, thanks to the cooperation of the local fishermen, but eventually it petered out. Without a body, there was never any funeral. Half crazed, Kay's parents would wander up and down the beach every day, or they would shut themselves up at home, chanting sutras. I want to go back to this line really quickly. Make sure you've circled it. The last line of paragraph 30 on page 140. He says, one way or another, though, I managed to recover, physically at least, and then I hope you circle this line, but my life would never be the same again. This is, of course, the central thesis of this, of this whole story. The fact that he experienced this as a child, now as an adult, the seventh man is clearly trying to process what kind of a group would he be in where he's telling a story like this and trying to process the fact that he will say about his life as an adult now, my life would never be the same again. What does that tell you? Jot down a couple of notes really quickly. We are now in uh, paragraph uh, 41 and following. This is, of course, the aftermath. That is to say, how does one live with the fact that this is what one experienced? Let's continue. Great a blow as this had been for them, though. Kay's parents never chided me for having taken their son down to the shore in the midst of a typhoon. They knew how I had always loved and protected Kay, as if he had been my own little brother. My parents, too, made a point of never mentioning the incident in my presence. But I knew the truth. I knew that I could have saved Kay if I had tried. There it is, right? I probably could have run over and dragged him out of the reach of the wave. It would have been close, but as I went over the timing of the events in memory, it always seemed to me that I could have made it. Guilt, right? As I said before, though, overcome with fear, I abandoned him there and saved only myself. It pained me all the more that Kay's parents failed to blame me and that everyone else was so careful never to say anything to me about what had happened. It took me a long time to recover from the emotional shock. Long time, right? I stayed away from school for weeks. I hardly ate a thing and spent each day in bed, staring at the ceiling. Kay was always there, lying in the wave tip, grinning at me, his hand outstretched, beckoning. I couldn't get that picture out of my mind. And when I managed to sleep, it was there in my dreams. Except that in my dreams, Kay would hop out of his capsule in the wave and grab my wrist to drag me back inside with him. And then there was another dream I had. Another dream. I'm swimming in the ocean. It's a beautiful summer afternoon, and I'm doing an easy breaststroke far from shore. The sun is beating down on my back, and the water feels good. And all of a sudden, someone grabs my right leg. I feel an ice-cold grip on my ankle. It's strong, too strong to shake off. I'm being dragged down under the surface. I see Kay's face there. He has the same huge grin split from ear to ear, his eyes locked on mine. I try to scream, but my voice will not come. I swallow water, and my lungs start to fill. I wake up in the darkness screaming, breathless, drenched in sweat. At the end of the year, I pleaded with my parents to let me move to another town. I couldn't go on living in sight of the beach where Kay had been swept away, and my nightmares wouldn't stop. If I didn't get out of there, I'd go crazy. My parents understood 
and made arrangements for me to live elsewhere. I moved to Nagano province in January to live with my father's family in a mountain village near Kumoro. I finished elementary school in Nagano and stayed on through junior and senior high school there. I never went home, even for holidays. My parents came to visit me now and then. All right, let's pause, put it in your notes. What's the aftermath? What's the immediate aftermath? Well, dreams, terrible dreams. We would call them, of course, nightmares. And notice these nightmares always come back to K and to drowning and to the realization of the horror of what transpired. Notice number two, after the dreams, the desire to somehow escape, to get away from it all. He ends up going away and, in, and doing school somewhere else. Jot down, why do you think he has to get away? Is it the memories of the place? The fact that every time he sees certain types of places, is it that he doesn't want to be around people who know that somehow he was a part of this terrible tragedy? We'll continue now. What is the next phase in his coming to terms with this terrible situation? I live in Nagano to this day. I graduated from a college of engineering in the city of Nagano and went to work for a precision tool maker in the area. I still work for them. I live like anybody else. As you can see, there's nothing unusual about me. He's normal. I'm not very sociable. But I have a few friends I go mountain climbing with. Once I got away from my hometown, I stopped having nightmares all the time. They remained a part of my life, though. They would come to me now and then, like debt collectors at the door. It happened whenever I was on the verge of forgetting. And it was always the same dream, down to the smallest detail. I would wake up screaming, my sheets soaked with sweat. That is probably why I never married. I didn't want to wake someone sleeping next to me with my screams in the middle of the night. I'd been in love with several women over the years, but I never spent a night with any of them. The terror was in my bones. It was something I could never share with another person. I stayed away from my hometown for over 40 years. I never went near that seashore or any other. I was afraid that if I did, my dream might happen in reality. I had always enjoyed swimming, but after that day, I never even went to swim in a pool. I wouldn't go near deep rivers or lakes. I avoided boats and wouldn't take a plane to go abroad. Despite all these precautions, I couldn't get rid of the image of myself drowning. Like Kay's cold hand, this dark premonition caught hold of my mind and refused to let go. Then, last spring, I finally revisited the beach where Kay had been taken by the wave. All right, so now we're coming to the end of the story. By the way, this is one of the reasons why we always scan to make sure we know how many paragraphs or pages of the story so that we can look and see, okay, we're at, pa uh, we're at paragraph 50. We're going to finish this story here in 15 paragraphs. So now we're coming to the end and we read this line about, then last spring, I finally revisited the beach where Kay had been taken by the wave. So now we're coming to the end. And of course, um, I, several of you are starting to figure out, oh, I get it. So what we've got going on here is, he says at the end of paragraph 47 that he could never share what happened with another person. And now all of a sudden he is sharing. And so we understand he's in some kind of a group, isn't he? Where he's the one sharing something powerful that has happened to him that forever changed his life. Now returning back to the place where it all took place is going to be for him a way to deal with the fear, the challenge of the fear of something so horrifically happening for him. All right, let's go ahead now. We'll finish up the story. My father had died of cancer the year before and my brother had sold the old house. In going through the storage shed, he had found a cardboard carton crammed with childhood things of mine, which he sent to me in Nagano. Most of it was useless junk, but there was one bundle of pictures that Kay had painted and given to me. My parents had probably put them away for me as a keepsake of Kay, but the pictures did nothing but reawaken the old terror. They made me feel as if Kay's spirit would spring back to life from them, and so I quickly returned them to their paper wrapping 
intending to throw them away. I couldn't make myself do it, though. After several days of indecision, I opened the bundle again and forced myself to take a long, hard look at Kay's watercolors. Key moment, right? Most of them were landscapes, pictures of a familiar stretch of ocean and sand beach and pine woods and the town. And all done with that special clarity and coloration I knew so well from Kay's hand. They were still amazingly vivid despite the years, and had been executed with even greater skill than I recalled. As I leafed through the bundle, I found myself steeped in warm memories. The deep feelings of the boy Kay were there in his pictures, the way his eyes were opened on the world. The things we did together, the places we went together, began to come back to me with great intensity. And I realized that his eyes were my eyes, that I myself had looked upon the world back then with the same lively, unclouded vision as the boy who had walked by my side. I made a habit after that of studying one of Kay's pictures at my desk each day when I got home from work. I could sit there for hours of one painting. In each, I found another of those soft landscapes of childhood that I had shut out of my memory for so long. I had a sense, whenever I looked at one of Kay's works, that something was permeating my very flesh. Perhaps a week had gone by like this, when the thought suddenly struck me one evening. I might have been making a terrible mistake all those years. As he lay there in the tip of the wave, surely Kay had not been looking at me with hatred or resentment. He had not been trying to take me away with him, and that terrible grin he had fixed me with, that too could have been an accident of angle or light. And